it's really a thrill for me to be uh, hosting today's program, in part because I have such a long history with Indonesia, and in big part because this is such an extraordinary film. And it's so interesting how often people say Empedagor is a horror film, and therefore you should be really scared. And believe me, you should be really scared. But that's not all you should be because there are so many other elements within this film, which I hope that we're gonna be able to explore with the three extraordinary guests we have tonight who were so important to the making of this story and being able to tell this story, which has a different kind of nuance, I think, for Indonesian audiences. And uh, I'm, I'm going to turn to Pajoko first because it's a story that, that has layers. I feel like there are layers, but maybe we could start with how did you come up with this idea and how long did it take you to to actually crystallize a film? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, so much, Rachel, for inviting us uh, to this program. Well, the way ideas uh, usually form uh, for my movies, uh, they usually don't come in one go or as in a complete story, uh, they usually came as bits. For Impetigor in particular, uh, one of them actually came when I was a child. Uh, my brother told me that shadow puppets were made of human skin. Uh, then there were some scenes, including when Nimis Ni, played by Ibu Christine Hakim, uh, she was actually came to shape in my dream as a child. Back then, I didn't understand where it came from. Now I think it was because of my mother. She had a really strong character. Sometimes she scared me. <laughs> then there was my reactions to social and political issues in the place where I live, Indonesia. All this then I combined to make a screenplay. So uh, I have to ask you, because people keep saying, well, is there a long legend of, of Wayang Kulit being made out of people? Uh, <laughs> not that I heard, heard, heard of, but there are some cases actually that, that, that I uh, found out during uh, the research of uh, making Impetigor. Uh, there were, there were uh, some cases back then, not, not now. Not that I know of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I think just to help the audiences who are not in Indonesia to understand why... You know, uh, for a lot of Americans or, or people outside of, of Indonesia, they think puppets are something for kids. But of course, Wayang Kulit has a much more nuanced popularity within the culture. And yeah. therefore, there is symbolism that goes beyond a puppet show. Yeah. Wayang Kulit is very prominent in Indonesia, even though it's originated in Jawa. But since Javanese people spread across Indonesia, uh, Wayang Kulit can be found anywhere. Uh, I was born and grew up in Medan, North Sumatra, uh, but I still uh, was able to, end up, to attend some of these shows. It's a traditional form of uh, puppet shadow play and uh, dalang or the shadow puppet, uh, which is the shadow artist, uh, he manipulates uh, carved leather uh, very beautiful, beautifully decorated, um, put on a put behind the screen uh, with a lamp behind it, and they will cast a shadow to life. Uh, the shadow puppet play it's mainly about good versus evil. It's very popular because Wayang Kulit offers a unique combination of uh, ritual uh, lessons for the audience and entertainment. Back then, when Islam came to Indonesia, they were used to spread the, the teaching of Islam as well. And um, Wayang Kulit is known as a high art in Jawa. You have to really learn how to, how to be uh, a dalang, the puppet master, and there are levels of uh, skills that you have to achieve to be a, a puppet master. And uh, a dalang is considered uh, someone who has not only the skill, but also the honor to have that profession in Indonesia. I mean, they even sometimes have kind of mystical powers. 
They do, I believe. Yeah. I believe they they do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So all of this goes into telling this story, I think, because because you have a puppeteer who is a leader of the village. Yeah. And is playing that role. Yeah. But what's so striking to me about the film is the kind of aesthetics, the way you took the idea of of the shadows. Yeah. And you you utilized it in the filmmaking. Could you speak a little to that? Yeah, um, like I mentioned earlier, the way the puppetry is presented to the audience is by having their shadow cast into a screen using only one source of light, usually. So a lot of setups in Impetigore were meant to capture this particular uh, feeling. Uh, the challenge was uh, how to make this more organic rather than stylish, because if you uh, se- uh, have a setup for your lighting in a particular uh, order, uh, not very normal, different from the usual uh, set of lighting. Sometimes your movie becomes stylish and not natural, but you want to achieve that authentic look. Uh, and you want the audience to believe that the world that you are present in your film uh, really exists. So we, we really plan out everything before shooting in great details. The coordinations of color and shape between the prop costumes and lighting, there has to be authentic there has to feel real. And the staging of the scenes, uh, the way the actors blocking the scenes often mimic the setup of a shadow puppetry with actors giving blocking as if they were inside the shadow puppet show, but they still have to be natural. They have to feel that they really live in real life. So all this were planned during the pre-production. You know, I really felt that and I could feel the humidity. I mean, when you say feel it, I could feel it on my body. I could even feel the heat. So, so you know, it was very successful. And, and that's a rare thing in a film that you feel it so viscerally. Um, maybe we could see a little bit of the, the village where you created this. And we could talk a little bit about that before we move on to characters. Oh, wow. Oh, the location hunting took such a long time because we understand that uh, we have to find a place that really feels authentic because everything else is authentic. So we have to feel the, 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 the place has to be authentic. We could always set it up, but if we can find a place where it's really secluded and remote uh, from, the real, from the modern world, that would be awesome. So we uh, scouted for five months to find this village. Um, all over Jakarta, all over Java, from the west to the east, and we could not find it. And one day, our art director met someone who usually did hiking in many places, through forests, through mountains. And he said one day he stumbled upon this very small village, only 40 houses uh, in that village. And it was built in the 40s by the Dutch for people who work in the plantation. Uh, But it was still cut out from the modern society. So we went there, it has no road. So we had to build road for our um, cars to, 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 to go there. And we, found the village and it was awesome. Everything that the script needed, it was there, except the people, the people were so nice. It's very funny because the Indonesian society, um, in the recent years, we tend to grow more intolerant. Um, We can say that, but people in this village, they are very diverse. They're not too, there, there were not too many people in this village, but there are many lifestyles going on and they can be very tolerant uh, to each other. So we decided to shoot the film there with the help of these villagers. That's so, great. Can we, can we so they play, hold on they a play in our films? Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, let's take a look at the village and then let's yes. continue. We have yeah. a little clip.
Ilmu Tanah Janem bercerita tentang seorang perempuan yang kembali ke tempat desa dia, dia dilahirkan. Dalam cerita, desa yang terpencil tidak pernah didatangi oleh siapapun dan mereka sudah berpuluh tahun hidup terisolasi. Jadi kita harus mencari sebuah desa yang otentik untuk cerita itu. Dan kita akhirnya menemukan sebuah tempat, kita bikin jalan supaya bisa dilalui oleh kendaraan kita. Hasilnya terbukti bisa dirasakan oleh para pemain bahwa mereka berada di sebuah desa yang sangat terisolasi dari kehidupan modern. Kita juga membangun beberapa fasilitas di desa tersebut dan kita juga membangun sebuah rumah rumah yang sangat besar dan setelah syuting akhirnya dipergunakan oleh penduduk setempat sebagai perpustakaan. I mean, it's just awesome. Um, I'd like to turn now, though, to Chris, to Ibu Christine, uh, because uh, the characters in this in this work are so um, they're very graphic, and they really hit you in a way that you're sort of unexpected. Um, and Ibu Christine, I've watched your work over many years. Uh, I think of you as the great warrior Chut Nadin and leading the, the, the troops and saving the day. And this is really different. And this is really scary. And your performance is just extraordinary because somehow you've been able to get both the humanity of the character, the tragedy of the character and the strength. So I wondered if you could speak about making that kind of a transition to a character that's so different from some of your past work. Ibu Christine, Ibu Christine. Uh, uh, unmute. Mute. mute. Unmute. Press your mute button. Yeah. I want you to know that in the film, she's never muted. <laughs> right? Ibu Christine, we'll come back to you in a second. While we're waiting for you to find the unmute button, <laughs> look at a, a little clip that we have of from the film. Tidak mudah menelusuri batin Nikmis Nini, gitu ya. Mungkin lebih banyak bitternya gitu loh buat dia, lebih banyak pahitnya gitu. Uh, tapi ya dia seorang perempuan yang kuat. Kalau masalah memang ini adalah sebuah tantangan sebagai seorang pemain pasti. Saya selalu ingin belajar sampai memang Tuhan nanti waktunya sudah selesai untuk uh, udah tamat. Sudah sekian puluh tahun kan? mengalai apa ritme yang sama gitu ya ini seperti recharging the battery gitu ya ini juga sebagai proses pembelajaran yang luar biasa so ibu christine please yes. tell us i mean it was such an amazing transformation Yeah, absolutely. This is not just. Uh, this is the first my trailer, trailer, uh, Solomon trailer character. But uh, of course, I cannot do it without help from anyone in the set. From Joko, of course, as a director, from the OP, from the artistic director, from other players also. You know, and you know what is a. Uh, Uh, crazy j director Joko, she uh, he uh, really create the atmosphere on the set. I almost forget that is the set. So I feel like I really live on the Nikmisni world. So and then of course uh, when I try to follow the soul of Nikmisni, that's the most difficult thing for me. Uh, and then until I realize, oh. Yes, Miss Ni is not Christine Hakim. Is always use the logic. I think Miss Ni didn't use the logic. Otherwise, it can, it's impossible that he can yeah, do it what uh, she did yeah, to the villager. 
and of course, and Joko always also make surprise on the set, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though yeah, uh, not just not written on the script, but uh, I many times I don't know what. For example, like the ritual scenes, yeah. Uh, during the preparation, uh, Joko and uh, the production gave me a choreographer for, you know, doing the movement. But on the set, Joko just told me, Ibu Christine, uh, I will f uh, the camera will follow you uh, about 30 minutes. So you have free to do what you will do. You have to do, yeah. So of course, uh, uh, it's I have to be quick, you know, to think what that I have to do. And again, I think if I'm too much thinking, I won't be doing it. So, and then I try to concentrate, maybe that, you know, my concentration is 99% uh, dot zero, 99 and only, I think zero dot one percent that I have to control myself. Otherwise, that you know, I will really will be trans, and Joko cannot direct me. <laughs> That's that uh, you know how is it different that I have to play as uh, Missy in this film. You know, yeah, it means that, uh, and also. Uh, the most important thing for me is very always excited to be on the set because I know that something new will be happen <laughs> from Joko and it like rehearsal for me to you know to practice my my spontaneity and my respond you know and also to think in a few seconds for it. and again. For example, like in the ending scene, it's not written that I have to be, you know, eat that can you imagine? And he came to, to uh, my base camp and then he said, Ibu Christine, uh, uh, the scene will be like this and you have to eat that. What? I said, <laughs> this again. You know, I just leave my logic and everything to do it. Uh, that uh, that uh, well, I, yeah. I have to jump over to Pajoko then. Mm -hmm. Pajoko, I know that you have a great care about children and and society. So ending the film that way is very powerful, and I couldn't help but thinking about it metaphorically. Like, how do we treat our children? What you know, it just throw to, throws up a, a question. Yeah. Is, is, was that part of your intention? Yeah, well, of course, there are relevant issues such as uh, abuse of power, fear, uh, fear mongering, and issues about social immobility of uh, women and children <clears throat> in Indonesia, in Impetigor. Um, and of course, um, for the ending, I want to really make uh, the audience got hit on the head. So, uh, as Ibu Christine said, uh, I came up with uh, with idea during the shoot actually how to really end the uh, movie with a bang. But even though the movie has something to say, uh, we really think that uh, what has to be the first experience in watching the movie. Is an accessible story that audience can easily delve into and characters that can be identify with. Yeah. So with empathy, always the audience would be willing to get into the world that we built, uh, follow the character's journey, and end up having something to reflect on mm -hmm. about the relevant issues that we infuse into it. Okay, now I have to go over to Bushanti <laughs> uh, because in addition to. Um, a scary film that won't let you sleep. You are also the producer. So there are other reasons you can't sleep. <laughs> a little bit about those challenges. Um, yeah, I actually, Rachel, this is my, uh,
uh, first horror film so to produce and I had to uh, also learn about the genre from Joko because I really wanted to work with Joko and then I really wanted to uh, <coughs> produce um, you know in this case horror thriller uh, and what came about in this project uh, uh, is uh, Joko and I had a uh, <coughs> Um, discussion about oh, uh, what to produce basically and what we wanted to do was to basically elevate a genre uh, just to give you context Rachel uh, talking about haunting <laughs> just yeah. to, to uh, give you a context at the time when we were discussing Jogo I think that was 2016 2017 right yeah, yeah. 2016 uh, there were about 100 Indonesian film distributed on screen. And 60 of them are horror films. 60. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a popular That's genre. Yeah. That's a popular genre, but also because uh, 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 people know that it sells, then there's so many films that is made fast. And also it has a stigma. The genre has a stigma of cheap production. Meanwhile, we know that this genre is, is it, it's, it needs like really a high set of skills to make a really go good uh, horror film, thriller film. Um, so Joko and I agree that we wanted to produce something that pushed the boundaries that basically bring this film, uh, the genre to uh, uh, a level where you, you know, it's like what we're discussing right now we talk about social commentary, we talk about characters, we, we talk about issues that's important. So, so um, the, the haunting part is, uh, so basically there's so many things that, you know, you need to do in a production. Joko was sick in the first <laughs> week of, of, of the production. And then it's, it's a, such a difficult uh, uh, location as well. So there's many, how to say obstacles, but I have to say the Impetic Gore family is such a strong and solid group that uh, we managed to basically uh, uh, overcome the obstacles. And this is also uh, uh, an international co-production as well. So our, what we call family also extended so outside of Indonesia. We have a co-production with, uh, with Ivanhoe Pictures from the U.S. and CJ Entertainment from from Korea. So, yeah. Were you? What kinds of responses did you get in Indonesia compared to when you showed it outside of Indonesia, say in Korea or other parts of Asia or or in in the, the U.S. Um, I think in terms of the box office release, we were one of the uh, for 2019. We were one of the like the highest gross, uh, ten, uh, one of the ten of highest grossing film in Indonesia. Uh, so it's really uh, a very good response. Um, Joko has a lot of uh, fans and followers who really like you know wait for his film because he always brings something new. And then and this one was really something l like left field. I think he even like even his fans like, oh wow, we didn't expect this. <laughs> So, so that was uh, that was such a such a delight, basically, Rachel, to be able to bring to the audience and also new audience something something different, and and especially the story is so rooted because of the wayang element, and then you know it sets in in Java, um, so it just gives a different meaning of of uh, what the horror film can be. So it was really good uh, response and. We were also very moved and very uh, surprised. Uh, I think Joko can can add uh, to my testament that we were also in, nominated and in the end won Best Picture in the uh, 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 Festival of Film Indonesia, which is the Indonesian Oscar. So the journey of this film has taken us in so many places that we, when we set out to produce, we just wanted to produce a good film. And the film just took us to so many places. That's, that's the beauty of it, including going to Sundance and, and you know, seeing different, uh, different, uh, different response to, to, the, 
You know, it really captures that sense of both tradition and modernity. And, and you know, thinking okay. about Rahayu and, and kind of being caught between worlds, worlds she didn't even know existed, is so interesting. And I, I know that that has become an important part. I'm wondering if you've seen other films where the idea of tradition and modernity are, are intermingled like this. Um, I think uh, there's many attempts, I think, uh, but I have to say, I think this one uh, really, uh, how do you say, uh, discuss or showcase different things, you know, is uh, it's very interesting to, I learned a lot about the genre, uh, Rachel. I mean, Joko sent me and said like, we were talking about, okay, this is this, this is, I want to tell a story about we de how do you find uh, haunt haunting? And then I said, okay, how haunting Joko? And then Joko said, I'm going to send you, a, I'm going to send you a DVD and you watch this film. And like, this is what I mean by haunting. I'm like, oh, okay, got it, got it. <laughs> and, okay. and so I, yeah, so I think what you were asking Rachel about modernity and local, I think, I think the film uh, really discussed well, showcased well, um, uh, the the dark side of humanity and all the characters in the film they're not they're not white they're not black they're all gray and we understand the reason why why they're bitter why you know they're in pain why they you know why the dark side come out uh, what is pure so that's uh, within the world context of very traditional and you know uh, uh, a city of people coming in with their Point of view, so it's all uh, very well interwoven. I think. <laughs> oh, Christine, you have yes. that moment where you're using movement. Mm. So chilling. <laughs> I'm just wondering, was that something that spontaneously happened, or did Pajoko say, "Okay, now go wild"? What happens there? Just as I said before, Joko just told me that Bukrisin, the camera will follow you. You just move uh, like what you want. And then what I want is that I don't know how to move. And then I just concentrate and leave everything. And I don't know, just come by the feeling. I didn't set up. I didn't design it. Just moving with the feeling what I had as an imisni. And I think because that a ritual, ritual scene, yeah, it's it means that, you know, to to the nature, to the to the what you call it, uh, not to the human being for but for others who live in their own worlds like communication. That I have to communicate with the nature, with everything that we cannot see by, uh, with our eyes and we cannot touch, but the energy is there. So I can say that's the most uh, energy that taking as an act and, and as an actress is that scene. Yeah. Until that after 30 minutes, I cannot stand it anymore. My energy is gone <laughs> and then I fall. <laughs> That's the ending. <laughs> so now, Pajoko, I have to ask you as a director, <laughs> you're making choices on, on what you want. You're meticulous. You've designed everything. And yet you know the potential of your actors and, and you're setting something up for them to, to meet you, as it were. I'm just wondering if you could speak to your process as a director. Unmute. Yes, uh, before we shoot, uh, we did an extensive uh, workshop to dig into the characters. So, so during the workshop, we very rarely read the script, actually. Um, I gave my actors uh, a complete uh, biography of their life from the moment they were born into which uh, into what kind of family they were born into, uh, into what kind of society they were born into. Uh, what school did they went? How was their uh, um, uh, childhood? Uh, is there any uh, milestones in their life that really shape up their characters? 
after I gave them the basis for the characters, and then we went into months and months to just dig into these characters. Um, we created scenes that are not in the script. Uh, we uh, we create uh, interaction between characters, and uh, I did interviews uh, to uh, dig more about the characters, and they have to come up with answers as characters. So when they come into the set during the shooting, they were ready as their characters. So whatever challenge or surprises that they were given during the shooting, they were ready as their character. So for instance, like uh, Ibu Christine, when she came to set, <laughs> she's, Ibu Miss Nimisni. She really understand Nimisni and how she interacts with other people and her environment. And because Ibu Christine such a wonderful actress that adds to the to the to the greatness of the of of her presence um whatever she does it's authentic because she is not Kristen Hakim anymore playing Nimisni but she is Nimisni and that also happens to other characters they really know the characters before we go to the set to shoot so Whatever thrown to them during the shooting, they know how to react. That's so important to have that backstory so that even though we as audience don't have that, they believe themselves to have those relationships already. Very important because um, I, I, I'm I also an actor, but not because I want to be an actor, but I want to know the process of my actor so I can I can work with them. Yeah. Um, and I found it's really hard when I'm on set, but I don't know what my character is in details. I I I I got difficulties even moving my hands because I don't know what I am. <laughs> so if I know who I am, I will not have to think about moving my hands anymore because I will be my character. Yeah. So so I want to jump over to one other thing that I thought was so crucial in the storytelling. And that is the soundscape, the music, and and we have to get to the Ode to Joy. <laughs> yes, we but have let's to. Let's start with yeah, we have to. But but let's start with because there's so much interesting. Sometimes it's music, and sometimes it's something that builds, and it and sometimes it anticipates something, and then it surprises you. Yeah. So it's it's a, a very powerful. Yeah, uh, sometimes people forget that uh, storytelling is everything in the film. So it's not just a screenplay, but everything within the film, the sight and the sound. And the sound, including the sound design and the music, has to be an integral part of the film. Um, because the movie is was designed to be very organic, the sound has to be very organic, the music has to be very organic. So we cannot use... Um, sound that is that sound um, uh, artificial. That's why we add so many organic sounds to it, like the 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 the, the chanting mm -hmm. um, uh, with real vocals uh, from our um, uh, artists. And there are a lot of uh, sound in the music scoring actually came from uh, real human voices. And we make sound, we engineer sound, not using musical instruments only, but something that we create. We hit wood, uh, pieces of wood, uh, we hit the ground and we create something from even coffee. We drop coffee and we record it, we, um, we uh, uh, engineer it to make, to make sounds, to be in our music scoring. So that's our music and the sound it has to really put the audience into the world of Impetigor. So we have the we have the the, the, the the picture, but it's the sound that really has to make people to be in the in the in the in the scene. It has to be people have to feel like they are in Nimisni's uh, house. They have to feel that they are beside uh, Dini when she was being held upside down to really feel that dread. So everything has to be really together, very gel. 
and that's an art itself. Uh, nothing, uh, whatever in the film, none of them has to be um, still the spotlight. Has everything has to be um, synergized, and that's that's how we collaborate with with every uh, artist in in the in the film, the crew and the cast. So I have a question though, because of course the sound comes after, right? Yeah. When you're shooting and you're you're getting all this amazing lighting and and shadows, do you have in your in your mind what the soundscape might be? Well, we we prep before even the ah. music. We discuss everything before we shoot. Ah. Okay. So during the pre production, we have the uh, produ pre production meeting with the crew that's going to go to the uh, shooting set. We also have a pre production meeting with people who are going to work in, at post including the sound uh, designers and the music uh, directors. Um, and during the shooting, the music directors actually created some music scoring already. And we usually uh, bring this music scores to set. And uh, I would play this music scores to the crew and the cast uh, to, for them to get the feel uh, of how the film is going to sound like. Um, so everybody knows how the movie or get a hint of the finished film, how it's going to sound and feel like. Ah. So I have a couple of questions that have come in from, from online. Uh, one is, have the people in the village seen the film and what was their reaction? We were about to show it actually, Mbak Shanti, but the pandemic happens. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we were going to do, what's Napak Tilas, the... Going back to the going back to the village, like tracking back, like tracking back. Tracking back. Yeah, in yeah. 2020, uh, also as a thank you for the villagers, but uh, I guess we we would have to do it after the pandemic's over. Uh, another question is, is but some of them had seen it. Oh, they because, have. Yeah. Because after the shooting, there were several people did uh, YouTube videos. They went to the village. Uh, they went to the village and um, um, making videos about the village and uh, the, uh, the house is still there because we built the house and uh, they showed the film to some of the villagers uh, according to uh, their videos on YouTube. And did you get any response, any reactions? Hopefully they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's another question from uh, online. They want to know if, if the film intended to give a message about Wayang Kulit as an art form. Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, um, there are many things we want to infuse uh, in Impetigor. Uh, when we... When the, we were... When we made Impeti uh, we were out on, on, on a mission. We wanted to make a film that is, while entertaining, it has to reflect the Indonesian, Indonesian society. Uh, horror has to be uh, faithful to its genre. It has to give audience that right, that is suspense, that excitement. Um, and um, we also want to infuse uh, new things to introduce to the audience. And I think uh, Wayang Kulit is something that is a very important heritage for Indonesian uh, people and it's very rich. It needs a really high art to be able to master it and it's diminishing right now. So we want to introduce it back to Indonesian audience, especially the younger generation, because um, there are a lot of things that you can learn by knowing your heritage. So that's one of the missions that we were out uh, to do when we, we, we out to make Impetigor. I mean, it's interesting because actually a lot of contemporary art in Indonesia uses some of the ideas that come from tradition. I'm thinking of someone like Eko Nugroho. Yes. And yeah. you know, he's using that, but he's totally taking it in a new direction and making new kinds of characters and even Katoprak he uses, you know. Yes. So it's it's it feels to me like this is part of a contemporary effort that is in film, but maybe also in some other forms, in contemporary art, in theater, you know, many yes. artists 
They're crossing over boundaries. They're also breaking boundaries. And it's great effort. And especially because horror is very popular, like Mbak Santi uh, mentioned earlier, we think if we can infuse wayang into something that is popular, it is going to be a great opportunity to reintroduce this art to, to the audience. Uh, yeah. Not just to outside people outside Indonesia, but also people in Indonesia ourselves. I'd like to, to shift for a moment because we only have about 15 more minutes. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Indonesian film, the, the, the industry now. And, uh, and Bushanti, if you could say a little bit about, because you're a producer, you're working internationally as well as domestically. What has changed in, in the field in the last, I don't know, maybe five, six years? And where do you think it's going? What, what, is, the new, what is the new direction? Um. Uh, for the Indonesian film industry, I have to peg it pre-pandemic, <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, of course. So we were growing at a very healthy rate. Um, growth means um, uh, this is one of very few countries where um, cinema screen is still growing, basically. So uh, there is a growth of 20%. Uh, it means each year there's more screens being built uh, because uh, for a large population of uh, you know, 260 million, currently we only have 2000 screens you know, uh, servicing. Uh, so wow. you, can, you can imagine how untapped, there's so many cities untapped for, uh, to, to still to be rich for, for cinema. So that's why we have a very healthy growth and this basically also combined with in 2016, the government lifted the, how do you say, the uh, film out of the negative list of investments. So then uh, uh, overseas, overseas investors can now, since 2016, can invest in the industry. So, so this triggered the growth uh, and the, the growth translates to uh, more screens, more people going to the cinema, and therefore more film production. Um, there's about maybe what 129 films being released uh, uh, per year. So that's uh, that's a lot of uh, that's films. That's a lot of films. That's a lot of films. Yeah. So I see growth that way, and also in 2019, uh, um, also the growth of. Um, um, uh, online platforms coming into the market as well. So we see it's a bit like China, uh, maybe 15 years ago, where you see the growth of cinema as well as the online platform like coming in, like in queue. So that's why the mention of like the golden, uh, the golden times because of this growth. Uh, but there's a lot of notes for that as well, uh, uh, which means we needed more um, gra graduates, you know, to be able to, uh, to be able to sustain the growth. We need high skilled people to build the industry as well. Um, so that's the state. And then, but what we really like is um, in 2019, if you even look at the, let's say 10 highest crossing or even the list of films, um, there's a variety. So it's not just one type of genre. There's a variety of, of, of genre films uh, that is being made and being released and also uh, um, different themes and uh, quite, we are taking risk. So, which is very good. <laughs> and, but unfortunately now with the pandemic, so we need to, it's a big stall. So we just need to see how this uh, will end or will will be solved, yeah. So I have a question for Ibu Christine. Uh, because you've been in this film industry for for a long time, so you've been able yes. to see changes, um, the ups and downs, and I'm just wondering if you have any any um, thoughts that you'd like to share on what, what changes you've seen over the last, say, 20 years. I still believe uh, whether the diet may 
Uh, like what you said, I am done of the film industry in uh, Indonesia. I'm already 48 years, <laughs> more than half of my age <laughs> in that film industry. But I still believe because uh, I know also now there is a lot of uh, 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 opportunity, basically, for the young uh, filmmakers. Yeah? And also during the latest uh, 10 or 15 years also there is young audience also came yeah uh, came so of course but uh, with uh, this pandemic situation i think it's more hard and difficult for the filmmakers without there is a political will from the government also to to yeah to make the industry survive and develop again because luckily that indonesia with a diverse country and the population the market is huge mm -hmm. and yeah and the latest yeah, i think many americans do not realize that indonesia yeah. is the fourth most populous nation in the world yeah it's big <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and also even that now the the uh, the cinema is still not open yet, right? Uh, or but with the OTT, it's like to you know fill in the empty situation of the film industry, and also the OTT is came. It's like you know it's growing, also it's very quick. You know, during the pandemic. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, so at least, oh, yeah, go ahead. The filmmakers have still a choice to uh, to build the creativity. The creativity is cannot stop. So that's a very, I think, if I want to take the positive from the worst situation, yeah. But we still have optimistic to build, and I believe. Because if I see even, uh, I think in other Asian country, they stop. No, they still not brave to uh, produce film or to make a serial for OTT. But in Indonesia, uh, I think okay, we are three months. Maybe it's not doing anything. But after three months, even the, during the pandemic, and of course that we still have to keep the. Uh, procedure of a health yeah like using a mask and swap and everything but you know the still that there is opportunity for to work the filmmakers to work yeah with. yeah so i have another question and i'm not sure if this goes to pajoko or bushanti maybe pajoko first and then bushanti um just thinking about how big film in asia has become and and at least in some instances let's say korea where the government had a, a very long-term investment in popular culture and seeing that as an export. And that has pros and cons uh, because, you know, do you want that much government involvement or do you feel that um, there are things that could be done that would help elevate and, and amplify Indonesia's film industry in ways that that aren't at the moment being done? Uh, government definitely has to be involved uh, to some extent, uh, especially in terms of making regulations that uh, can make the ecosystem healthier uh, for Indonesian film industry. Um, the tax uh, scheme has to be supportive of the film industry. Right now we think that Uh, the uh, taxation of uh, film industry is still very uh, um, makes us difficult to work because it's multiple tax system for uh, our film productions. Uh, in ha it has to be reduced uh, greatly to make the uh, film industry healthier. And um, also in terms of uh, how to make Uh, people really want to invest not just in production, but in post-production uh, facilities, for instance. Uh, because in Indonesia, um, we still have to go abroad to uh, do post-production. Uh, to Thailand, to many other countries. 
but if we can make some incentive uh, by the government for people to invest in this kind of facilities, probably we can do everything in Indonesia. Um, also, we have to make the system uh, regulation to make us easier to create a film from the day it was uh, from the inception, from the way it was uh, planned. Uh, for instance, right now, even to find locations to shoot is very difficult because there is no there is no uh, an office that we can go to to process the location that we want to shoot. We have to go to many uh, parties. We have to contact the police. We have to contact sometimes um, the talks, the local government, and many other uh, parties that is not synergized. So if everything can be uh, put together into a very comprehensive system by the government under one uh, comprehensive regulation with a tax system that is not uh, difficult for filmmakers to follow, I think it's going to be a healthier ecosystem for us to grow as a film industry. And we want to hear those stories. So, yeah. really <laughs> Bushanti, you, you are working both uh, domestically, but also you have done substantial work internationally. What's your perspective? Um, I want to add actually to what Joko was saying, and then I'll, I'll answer to you. Um, the context, I think it's important for the government to basically be involved and support. And, and like the example that I gave you, um, the growth was triggered also by a, how to say, a correct policy reform, like, you know, the, ne the negative lift uh, of investment. You can see the chain reaction. So what, we're, what was Joko was saying, if that is implemented well, um, the policy reforms, that will enhance it even more. Because right now, uh, uh, the, the data are not synchronized. You know, the, the services are not in place. You know, let's say like film commission, because we're shooting all over Indonesia and Indonesia is vast. And so these, all these things need designing, needs planning, um, including the tax included. Um, and number two is also, and this is actually, it sticks in my head because um, I um, in early 2000, I had a discussion with the head of COVID actually at that time. And then um, this was at the cusp of their growth. And we, I was exchanging notes and I said, so what's, a, what's important? He said, um, what you need to really remember, you can talk about policy, tax, everything, but it's the, it's the humans, <laughs> it's the, the, the filmmakers. You need graduates. If you want to basically uh, build an industry of a certain size, how many graduates do you need? So, and I said, so how did you, you know, how did you plan it? Is that Korea from X amount of uh, uh, university of colleges um, to, because they're set to have thousands and thousands of graduates by, you know, by a certain year um, to basically feed the industry. And that's one thing that I think we're still behind. Uh, 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 maybe the government needs to do an incentive for, again, designing how, if you're building a banking system, you need accountants, tellers, you know, you need auditors in the industry, you need filmmakers, writers, art directors. So we need to also design this supply of high skill set uh, um, artists, basically. So, and I think that's um, in terms of the, um, um, you know, the policies for the government. For the difference, I think, um, the difference is what I like about the Indonesian film industry is actually the growth is quite organic, Rachel. Uh -huh. So that's why, that's why I think it's important because it's market driven and it's quite organic and we're very creative people. So with just this little, just one policy, the growth is already shooting up high. But can you imagine if, this is being fed more. It can be much, much more. So it's really a balancing act, isn't it? 
it is a balancing act. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. We only have two minutes, so I'm going to give each of you uh, 45 seconds <laughs> to tell us what's coming next. And uh, Boo Christine, what's coming next for you? Mm, there is many excited, exciting project, especially from Joko. <laughs> 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 give <her> over to me <laughs> with the Indonesian superhero. <laughs> and oh. this, um, yeah. <laughs> and okay, double spoiler. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> okay, see what's and coming. also in this opportunity, <laughs> I will say thank you to the American audience who give a very big appreciation for Impetigor. And it's really like, a, you know, a supplement <laughs> given as a energy, you know. Mm. <laughs> and of course, thank you also for the Asia Society. Mm. You're very welcome. Pushanti. Um, uh, we're, I'm actually, we're in the middle of a shoot uh, of a uh, romantic comedy in Japanese language uh, with a leading uh, comedian and YouTuber. And then we're shooting another film in August uh, uh, with a female director, leading female uh, director, Gina Esnur. And this one will be a science fiction uh, genre. Oh, yes. Oh, that's great. Okay, Pat Joko, you get the last word. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'm producing two uh, movies. Uh, the follow-ups to uh, Gundala, uh, our superhero film that was released 2019. One of them starring Ibu Christine Hakim, and um, uh, we are we are going to release it uh, sometime next year. Well. I can't believe this has gone by so fast. And I apologize to the, all the people that wrote other questions that we didn't get to. Um, this has been such a pleasure. And I, I hope we get to repeat it with another one of your films. So, uh, you know, count us in. Asia Society at the Movies wants more. And, uh, and to all of you who've been watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you can see Impedagor if you didn't get a chance to see it, it is on Shutter, at least in the U.S. And uh, I just want to thank all of you, Bushanti, Bu Christine, and Pajoko. Thank you so much for sharing tonight. And good luck with all the next projects. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next film. Thank you so much. <laughs>